यथोर्नाभे सृजते गृन्नते यथा पृथिव्या मोषधय संभवती यथा सत पुषा केशलो मानी तथा क्षरा संभवती हिश्व यथोर्णना सृजते गृन्नते यथा पृथिव्या मोषधय संभवती यथा सत पुषा केशलो मानी तथा क्षरा संभवती हिश्व As the spider sends forth and withdraws in its web, as on earth herbs grow, as from a living man hair grows on head and body, so from the imperishable, the universe emerges. Iha, here. संभवती विश्व अक्षरा अक्षरा फ्रॉम द इम्पेरिशबल विश्व मीन द यूनिवर्स संभवती एमर्जस् ना हाउ डज द यूनिवर्स एमर्ज फ्रॉम द इम्पेरिशबल दिस मंत्र गिव्स अस थ्री सिमिलीज to illustrate the spontaneity of creation how out of brahman has the universe emerged or has the universe arose it's a very fa famous verse of cotton the methodology used in this mantra is upamana which means comparison they're giving similes and metaphors to compare how the world has emerged from the imperishable brahman <clears throat> now why you may say why does he give three mantras in so three analogies in one mantra he gives three analogies in one mantra to tell you that no particular analogy is complete no analogy is perfect no example is perfect if you had noted in the classes in the teachings we don't rely on examples to convey a point so you don't convey a point through an example you establish a point on logic and then give an example to substantiate it because if you establish a point on an example it has its shortcomings it has its limitations which you will see very clearly so no analogy is complete so don't if you if at all you are in an argument or trying to convey a point don't use an example to rely on it so the idea is no explanation of creation is complete any amount of explanation the various analogies various theories given given in the shastras how the world has emerged from brahman now here the incompleteness of the first simile is covered up by the second simile the shortcomings of the second simile are covered by the third simile and he gives up and says there is a shortcoming in the third simile also so don't use similes to convey your message now what are the three similes the first he says just as a spider spins and withdraws its web the second just as on earth grows herbs and vegetation the third is just as hair grows from a living man so first is of a spider very famous uh, metaphor people associate people recall 
that this is Mundaka Upanishad from the three similes. So you may forget in the future the three the Mundaka Upanishad, but if you remember the three similes, ah, you you know what you're talking. You are you know the Mundaka Upanishad. So Harish, you can say I have heard Mundaka Upanishad. How I know the three similes? So you are in safe zone. Okay. I like the new look, Harish. Thank you. So the first simile, he says, as a spider makes, as a spider sends forth and withdraws its web. Now, if you analyze the an analogy, the web comes out of the saliva of the spider. So saliva is a part of the spider. So you say the universe is a part of Brahman, which is fair to say that, because the entire world is nothing but a mere insignificant speck in the cosmos. The entire cosmos is nothing but an insignificant speck in the grandeur of Brahman. If you were, you know, there is the, <laughs> if you want to just understand how ridiculous what it is, they say, if you take the whole, if you take the whole circle, this as Brahman, imagine this is Brahman. I'm being, little, being very generous here. This spot is the world. So now you understand the insignificance of the world compared to the magnitude of what Brahman is. So it is not wrong to say that the world exists in Brahman, just like the saliva is a part of the spider, it comes out of the spider. So universe is a part of Brahman. So you can say Brahman spat out the universe. I'm sorry, I can't. That's why I turned my head there and spit. I can't spit it to you on the screen, no? So I turned there, two, I spit. And the two of Brahman is the world. And they were all the germs in that spit. However clean and tidy you are, you are all a germs, moving germs. Chi, 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 chi. Very, very inauspicious. Okay, this is what, this is what you get into absurdities. Once you start decoding a an analogy. Now, what the flaw in an example is, the spider spins a web so that it lives in it. So the web is its creation. The web is its house where it goes and lives in. Isn't it? Now, if you draw the comparison because the spider is the Brahman, the web is the world, then you say Brahman has created a, a world to go and live in it. Seems ridiculous, isn't it? So the flaw there is that Brahman, you're attributing a motive to Brahman. But a spider has a motive when it creates that spins the web because it wants to go and live in it. So Brahman has no motive in creating the universe. So that's a safe way to find the flaw that there is no motive in Brahman, but the spider has a motive. It is, it's not complex philosophy, it's just simple, straightforward aspects of comparison, right? which you can compare and beyond a point it becomes Ridiculous or ludicrous. 
Aram, ludicrous, sir. Huh? Ridiculous or ludicrous? Hmm. So, and then he gives the second simile to cover up the flaw in the first. So, what is the flaw in the first? The flaw in the first is the spider has a motive. Then he gives a second simile. He says, just like earth yields vegetation. So there he says, when the earth yields vegetation, year after year, season after season, I know not for how many generations from time immemorial, the earth has been yielding vegetation. Now, when the earth yields vegetation, when the earth produces vegetation, earth has no motive. So he corrects the flaw in the first of the motive in the spider by saying the earth, when he says earth produces vegetation, there is no motive in the earth. Very good. Commendable. He's corrected the snag in the first, but there's also a snag in the second. Now, what is the snag in the second? The earth is inert, insentient, is dead. There is no life in earth. Because earth is inert matter. But Brahman is not inert. Brahman is not insentient. Brahman, in fact, is that life-giving principle. So when you say earth produces vegetation, you are comparing and bringing Brahman down to insentient dead matter. There's a flaw there. Brahman is inert. Sorry, the earth is inert, but plants are living. So how can you say Brahman is dead, but the world is alive? There's a flaw there, isn't it? Are you all with me? Brahman is not dead, just like the earth is not dead. The plants are living. Yes, you and I are living. To say that I have come from a dead Brahman or inert Brahman is not true. So the flaw is, how can you say out of inert Brahman, living beings have emerged? No. Then he corrects that snag. By saying, from a living man, hair grows on head and body. So the inertness is clarified by comparing Brahman to a man. He says, a man from a living being arises. Hair. So the inertness of earth is clarified by saying, from a man, from a living being, hair grows. Now, if you carefully analyze here, there's a flaw here also. When you look at a man, you see the man and the hair at the same time, don't you? When I look at you, I see the hair and I see you. Though in some people, it's hardly anything there, but that's okay. In some people, there is little bit there. That is uh, subjective to personal reasons. Hairstyle. But when you see Brahman, sorry, when you see a man and hair together, it's like saying you see Brahman and the world at the same time. You cannot see Brahman and the world appear at the same time. They do not appear at the same time. So there's a flaw there. So there's a flaw in each metaphor. Brahman and world don't appear at the same time. Brahman is the reality. The world is illusion. 
isn't it? So when you say Brahman and world are seen at the same time, it's not possible. There's a flaw there. Like the man and the hair are seen at the same time. There's a flaw in the, the third metaphor as well. So what is the message that any amount of you trying to conceptualize the creation of Brahman is a futile attempt. Brahman cannot be captured. Then you may say, why are these masters wasting their time trying to give so many theories and metaphors? One mantra wasted, no? In fact, the next two mantras also he carries on in a, in a way. Then why are, do you think theories are given? Not only here. Everybody seems to be giving theories. Adam and Eve came together, started the species of living beings. Two donkeys, male and female came, the donkey species were born. Two male and female giraffes came, the giraffe species born. Two male and female frogs came, we were born. Two male and female fish for the lily pond came and the breed started. Huh? That's how all things started. Isn't it, Arab? That's how they say no. That's the theory of there also, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> particularly the fish in the lily pond. I, I know, I know. <laughs> now, but then why are they giving so many theories when you know that you can't capture the concept of creation? Why do you think they're giving so many theories? Hmm. Any idea? Glad to man. These reasons are given so that at least uh, we don't restrict to the, these items what the people say, like, you know, this is what it is, Brahman. So we don't put a cap to our thought and uh, restrict to our uh, thinking process up to there. And we always say that uh, this is not the one. So when you cannot concept that what is not there, they keep on removing it. And finally, we reach the pinnacle. So as uh, our Jarajima our, our also is saying, do you mean to say that it's, it is given to negate it? You, negate and I, is, this is you, you and I are analyzing the simile and find a flaw in it, isn't it? But the similes are given for what reason? Various theories of creation are given for what reason? At least to conceptualize, or to my knowledge, you cannot restrict our thought process to that and then limit it to that process. As you say, Adam and Eve and other things, what you were mentioning, example, people have put a blanket over there and decided that is what is the final or the origin of the universe. But actually, it is beyond that. So, and since it is not cannot be explained, we are up to come to a certain level, and this is what it is. It's just a pointer to the uh, final destination. Like right? pointer to whom? Pointer. We cannot say it is just a pointer to the Brahman, but again, you are allowed to go beyond no, no, the pointer no. to see that. Indeed, it's a pointer of Brahman, but a pointer to whom? It, it, it is seems a pointer to, be a, to, to you and me. Yes, pointer to us. That A pointer to you and me who are able to rationalize. But for many who can't rationalize.
it is given just to appease their mind. It is just given to appease their inquisitive mind as to what is the cause of creation. Because you can't satisfy them in any other way. Yes. So just to satisfy their curiosity, to appease them temporarily, they say, who created the world? Oh, God created the world. Who is God? Nobody questions beyond that. Only when you question the very term God, then you understand, I don't know who God is. I don't understand when you say God created the world. It's an unknown term. Then you start logically approaching that concept, what that unknown is, from the known terms. That's when you take a logical inquiry into the unknown. But an inquisitive mind, the majority of the ignoramuses, they are quite content when you say Adam and Eve, as you said, they, the lid is closed and say, this is what it is. Yes, God, the whole world has emerged from that. <coughs> but nobody asks, where did they come from? Nobody questions that because their intellects are very shallow. So they, they just gulp it down. Apa, this is what is creation. So these theories and allergies are given. So even the guru spins a yarn of various theories only to satisfy a curious mind. That's about all. Hmm? But it's to understand, you and I understand that the, this is not, it is, it is only a mere storytelling going on. This is not real philosophy. Okay. Right. Yes, Siddhuji? Uh, this uh, analogies are given to explain the grandeur. These analogies are uh, futile, but uh, these all, all these are uh, extraordinary analogies. But the same cannot explain the grandeur of uh, Brahman. Yeah, they cannot. It is just uh... no, but uh, that itself also. To some extent, gives us a picture of uh, it's so it's beyond uh, thinking. Hmm. It gives us the the limitation of our thinking, isn't it? And allows us to expand our thought and not limit it to mere stories or theories. So you and I, as a serious seeker, will not be content with all these theories. So you may give me all these stories, but I don't, I'm not satisfied. So as a serious seeker, what is the cause of creation of the world? As a serious seeker, if I were to ask you, what is the cause of the creation of the world? My ignorance, that's all. Which nobody will accept outside. They will not be able to relate to when you say it's ignorance of Brahman that has created the world. Once the ignorance is wiped out, there is no world at all there. You and I will relate to that, but not to these theories. When you may say, why are you teaching us these theories? I'm teaching because the Guru mentions it here. The Upanishad, the Guru spells it out, I'm telling it. But we understand it's <clears throat> in mere shallow theories. So what you and I should establish? Kishish, I know it will be difficult to difficult pill to swallow the first thing in the morning. What time is it there for you now? It's afternoon, Guruji. Oh, good afternoon, Kashish. Good afternoon, Guruji. Yeah. So what is the most difficult pill to swallow? What is established in all this, especially taking the point from what I just spoke to Setuji, the last concluding remark. It is ignorance of Brahman as a cause of the creation. So what do you establish with all this Vedantic understanding or learning? What do we establish? In fact, what is the highest truths 
I'm trying to make it easy for you to answer. That's why I'm explaining the question. What's the highest truth for Vedanta? I'm not sure if this is correct, Guruji, but my answer is kind of like either that our ignorance is, is the cause of everything and Vedanta is not the cure necessarily, but is a way to like acknowledge that or that we will never be able to fathom Brahman. Like our minds cannot compute. No, you are absolutely right, but uh, it wouldn't be difficult to mention what the highest teachings say. In fact, the highest teachings of Vedanta. What what would that be in the context? If you stretch that idea, in fact, you conclude there. That's why I'm, that's why I, I'm just extending the thought. If you extend this thought rationally, you conclude there. Fair enough, uh, Kashish. I uh, I just said it's very uh, uh, I don't know whether it's too much to expect, but it is. It could be a, a rational conclusion. All right, let's leave, leave it there. Uh, Vasanta Ma, tell me what is the rational conclusion to all this? That the whole world is in Maya. Then what is real? Real uh, cannot be conceived or captured. Can only be experienced. Indeed, indeed. In fact, the the highest teachings of the shastras is what is what you said is. <clears throat> Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya Isn't it Vasantama? Just to Isn't say it? that the Brahman is Satyam is the reality the world that you are experiencing is a Mithya, is an illusion this is the 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 highest declarations of the masters of the Upanishads. So by saying that these theories and analogies cannot explain the creation, they cannot cre explain nor capture the creation because there has been no creation. You can explain something if it has happened. From their standpoint, the world doesn't exist. So how can you capture something which has not happened? So what do you conclude? What's established is there is no world. Therefore, there is no need of any explanation that there is a world because there is no world. But since you are seeing a world, since you are experiencing world, they are giving various theories to appease you. That's all. You get it. They are giving theories because you see a world. From their standpoint, they are saying the world that you see is an illusion. It doesn't exist. It is a mithya. It is just like a dream. Can you tell me where is the dream now? Where was your dream? That you, when you dreamt yesterday night or the early this morning, you were dreaming. Now there's no dream for you. But where does the dream exist? Imaginary. Imaginary. It was an imaginary world. Now you know it didn't it doesn't exist at all. Isn't it? So to bring that idea into the current transactions, our, our current transaction with the world. So while transacting, if there is a ray of thought, you know, when these workers, you know, when they work at these high rise buildings or they, they repair this high tension wires, or, you know, they are at very high height. They have that safety hook. 
in and they are they are balancing themselves and working there is a safety net a safety no hook they have that is a safety line in fact other day there was a video that came up that few workers were actually sleeping having a nap at a, they were trying to get set up or repair some bridge and that the peak of that bridge was in fact above the the clouds and they all were having actually having a nap and one fellow is videoing those three four fellows having a nap just on that st stretch of a, a small pole or something and what you could see is that they just have a hook there and one fellow is seeing his phone sitting right above the clouds just on a pole it's just amazing uh, there's no fear in them so it's like that safety hook they there is that ray of thought that protects you that immunes you from getting sucked into the world is this world is maya so why you get into every transaction like why well, every experience you get into if i can tell myself it is not worth getting carried away with it but i will do it because it's my dharma i tell you you will have ultimate objectivity right through the experience i have to do if because it's my dharma i do it <clears throat> but right through you say it is not worth getting excited it's not worth getting tempted it is not worth getting carried away if i tell to myself silently and yet do it that is in line to the highest teaching of the shastras so kashish are able to relate to that idea which we were just mentioning i am able to understand it i don't know if i'm able to relate or practice it very well guruji but yes yeah, in the sense you you are able to understand you know, it takes yes. a lot it takes it demands a lot out of everybody to to practice this you know but uh, at least that idea that this what these masters are trying to bring it down to us you now how much i am able to practice it is uh how sattvic you are <clears throat> to the extent you are sattvic to that extent you will relate to it you now why do we say sattvic the question is why do why do i say how to the extent let's say kashish is 40% sattvic okay so 40% you can relate to it 60% you can't relate to it why do i say that because in theory i'd be 40% able to be retain that disinterested interest be that witness why not 60% because the other percents may be rajasik or tamasik and what about them as in rajasik would be overly emotional overly attached and tamasik would be um like i don't know if the term is like laziness or like just disinterested to the point of like not even doing your basic duties spot on rajas is your passion will take you into the world you will get attached you will get carried away you have a value for the world you are interested that the world should reciprocate you are very much trapped in that desires rajas tamas is ignorance you know you are in sloth or laziness or an attitude of heedlessness so that you will still get caught up so the moment the tamasic quotient wakes up you again get into rajas you still get carried away but sattva is that rightly said disinterested interest hmm? perfect kashish great so yes uh, Ash ashama has sent a private message in fact she said so the key word is that you must be detached to everything 
indeed you can only be detached to something if you have no value to it <clears throat> if i say be detached to wealth what wealth you have be detached to it you may not be able to detach because you you for you i'm not being personal here it may be difficult for you it will be difficult for you to be detached to your family it will be difficult detached to uh, your friends i'm just throwing examples it will be difficult to detach your emotions if your emotions are not met you say big deal if somebody doesn't cater to my emotions would you say so what oh he didn't greet me this morning look at him he didn't wish me at all yeah very arrogant fellow are if somebody doesn't greet you somebody wish you somebody say hello to you or namaskar to you hari om to you good morning to you oh what yeah the world going is your world going to come to an end based on a greeting or a whatsapp smiley or a whatsapp heart is it all what life brings on come on so you should ideally be detached to everything but it's not possible because it's directly depend on your sattvic kosha okay hari ji <clears throat> good ji i i feel that these uh, multiple similes are given imperfect uh, similes uh, to, to to highlight to the very highly evolved uh, upanishadic student the master tells them don't waste your time in search of the perfection and the infinite in the finite world you will never find it it will all be infinite infinite and the infinite things will never be perfect you mean the finite things yeah i i meant finite will never yeah. be so don't waste your time in search of going all over the world to find out the infinite you will never find a perfect finite at least i believe it's only the the theorems or the similes isn't it the, the, the theories and the similes because rest of the upanishad is perfect <clears throat> this doesn't apply to the rest of the upanishad isn't it correct hari ji also is imperfect don't believe anything that he says suddenly he disappeared you are non existent to us sir neither do you exist nor your answer exists this is how great masters convey that everything is maya it's your if you have saw me till now it's only your imagination i did not exist great masters have ways and means of communicating i my humble prostrations to you hari ji you are a, indeed a great mahatma no not that i had any doubt but now it is declared it's announced it's pronounced uh, ram ji you would agree ram ji Hundred percent, sir. It is a great it demonstration. It's a great uh -huh. demonstration of the perishable perishability of all of us. Correct, sir. Hmm. It can't be so spot on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But one question, sir. In this, yes, sir. All the three examples he gives, and in the end, he says, "So from the imperishable, the universe emerges." Hmm. But actually, all the three examples—that is, spider, earth, and hair, and man—all the three are perishable. Huh? So actually, um, it is uh, he is quoting all perishables only, but he is concluding that the imperishable gives rise to the perishable universe. so i was a bit uh, confused with that uh, seeming contradiction in the no 
No, uh, the the analogies are explaining how the perishable has emerged from the imperishable. Uh, but how <clears throat> how the emergence has come about. Uh, but the sources of emergence here are perishable only. They are not imperishable in all the three. No, if you say the the web gets perished, but the spider doesn't perish. The vegetation but, perishes, but the earth doesn't perish. The hair perishes, the man doesn't perish. It's still ah. relatively relatively imperishable, no? How can you say it's not perishable? Relatively imperishable? It is a relatively, yeah. So you're you're also proving to us, sir, that it is imperishable. I'm very sorry. I'm very you need to punish me, sir. No. <clears throat> uh, you don't mind me being very explicit, sir. Definitely, sir. No problem. If if I were to see your old photographs 15, 20 years ago. <clears throat> hmm? Yes, sir. The hair existed, no, sir? Absolutely. I used to look very good those days. Yeah. Even now you look very charming, sir. <laughs> they don't get me wrong at all, sir. You look very charming now also. But the hair is now not perishable. It means hair is perished, isn't it? Perishable, yeah. But Ramji is imperishable relatively. You existed Only relative, 20 yeah. years. No, no, yes. Nothing is absolute. But yeah. the idea when you say that the source is imperishable is not true. I'm saying it is wrong to say that. The source also is conveying the imperishable nature. Like the saliva from which the web comes out, the web perishes. There's, the spider can spin hundreds, thousands of webs in its lifespan. So the lifespan of the spider is far beyond the lifespan of its creation. Yeah, that's... The earth yeah. is continually producing. The vegetation dies, but the earth is imperishable. <clears throat> Similarly, the man exists. The hair may come and go. <laughs> yeah. Like when I when I shaved this morning, there's no more hair seen. But I exist. The hair again produces. So it is perishing. <clears throat> but the man doesn't perish. So in that sense, relatively, so yeah. no analogy, as you say, is complete. But if you extend, interpret that way, it yeah, yeah. does fit in, I believe. Yes, sir. Yes. Isn't it, sir? Yeah. But ultimately, the, the understanding, as we said, is that we can't go by a, a simile or a metaphor. Fall back on the philosophy that we learn. Right, sir? Yes, sir. Right, sir. You okay, sir? Yeah. Right. Hariji, you will have to listen to the recording. Okay. Please listen to the recording and connect with me in private. Okay. Because we have established certain non-existence. Okay. So I don't want to change my stance after establishing certain truth. Okay. So you please maintain your maunam. Right, let's move on, mantra eight. 